Well, usually this is the time of year when we're preparing for Holy Week. And in our church's calendar, we usually have our Good Friday service with uh, scripture readings and hymns. Usually the scripture readings revolve around the seven last words of Christ. And then on Resurrection morning, we'll have our two worship services and one in the park, one in the church building. There will be the Continental Breakfast. It's really a high point in the church year. This year, though, it's a bit different. We won't be meeting together in person, but thank goodness for technology, we can still go on and get the message out. The message of what happened to Jesus during that Holy Week. And today, what I want to do is, is I want to enter into the mind and heart of Jesus. I want to go back to the Garden of Gethsemane and look at what happened to Jesus, how he was suffering, both body and soul, during those last hours that he was with his disciples during his earthly ministry. Let's see what Scripture has to say from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 32 through verse 42. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and, be, and he became greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet... Not what I want, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to him, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. As I read this scripture, there is one thing to me that just stands out. It's fear. Now, we're living in a time where there is a great deal of fear. If you have read the newspapers or listened to the news, perhaps you have an online journal you subscribe to. Fear. Fear is on the minds of everyone, and you would find such headlines as these. The dollar is over with. Our freedoms and our liberties... They're going to be gone in the future. Our government is going to change in the future, all because of what this virus has brought upon us. And, and, and then elderly people in our congregation, you may have fears too. The fear that I can catch this terrible disease, and it is terrible, and I've seen pictures of what the coronavirus can do to a person's lungs. There is the fear that there may not be a respirator for you if you do have to go into the hospital. And in the church world, fears are being amplified too. There are some who are saying, well, what we're going through is the wrath of God. Well, I don't know if it's the wrath of God or not. Certainly God does bring judgment on this world, but I don't know if it is in this case. So what I want us to do, though, is to enter into those fears of Jesus in Gethsemane. And I want to compare our fears to his fear. Now, the story takes place in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the garden was located towards the east of Jerusalem. And when you think of a garden, what comes to your mind? You think of green grass, trees, perhaps flowers, children playing. 
Adam and Eve had a garden to live in. And in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be another garden. The mind turns to peace, well-being. But that's not what is happening to Jesus Christ here. It is not the peaceful picture of the browns and greens of summer. Instead, it's the darkness of the soul of what Jesus Christ is going through. And I want you to notice the number of times the fear of Jesus is referred to. For example, in verse 33, it says he was greatly distressed and troubled. In verse 34, my soul is sorrowful. And in verse 35, look at what's happening to Jesus. It says he went away a little further and he fell on the ground and prayed. Now, we don't know how to understand that in our mind. But grammatically, I can tell you, here's what's happening. Jesus is falling over and over again, and he's turning to prayer. What's happening to Jesus here? Why is he in such fear? Well, verse 36 tells us he wants this cup taken from him. And that cup symbolizes the wrath of God. It is not a cup of refreshment that you would need on a hot day after cutting the grass in the summer. It is not the cup, the cold beverage, that you might want with ice after you've run a marathon in the summer. It's not the cup of coffee that wakes you up in the morning. It is the cup of God's wrath. And we can go back into the Old Testament to the prophet Jeremiah, where Jeremiah says, Before you, take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath. Jesus knows he is going to have the wrath of God poured out upon him. He knows he is going to face the judgment of God. And I think the only way we can relate to what Jesus Christ may be going through is what goes through your mind the night before surgery. Where you, you are up all night, you're tossing and turning, you have all of the fears that are going through your mind of what your body is going to go through. You think of the pain you may suffer. And those thoughts are on your mind until you are finally put asleep so that you can endure the surgery. Or perhaps you should think of it this way. What if you were on death row, what would be going through your mind? Well, Jesus is on death row, and he has to face the Heavenly Father, who is going to pour out the wrath on him that was due for you and me because of our sins. Yes, we have many fears this Holy Week, but I want you to think of Jesus and what he went through. Because that puts our fears into perspective. See, we're not facing the wrath of God. Jesus did that. Now, yes, God sends his discipline upon us at times, but we are not facing the wrath of God. And I think while our fears may be legitimate of what can happen to us, we also have to realize that they're nothing in comparison to the fear that Jesus Christ went through. And as we face these fears, keep something else in mind as well. Submission. Listen to what Jesus has to say here in verse 36. He says, Abba, Father... All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus Christ had a human body just like we did. He knew what he was going to face, and he asked that the cup should be taken from him. He knew that tasting the scalding cup of the wrath of God was going to be painful. And he wants it taken away. But on the other hand, 
he is willing to submit to the will of God for our salvation and for the glory of the Heavenly Father. He was willing to do it. He was willing to submit. He was willing to say, yes, Heavenly Father, whatever you wish, I will do because it's for the good of your people and it's for your glory. And as we face all that we have to in this changed world of ours, that same thought of Jesus should be in our hearts as well. The coronavirus has upset our comfortable lifestyle, but we are still to submit to God because we're going to face a lot that's not in our control, but it is in the control and it is in the hands of God. And sometimes God works through suffering saints, not comfortable Christians. We have the ability to bring glory to God and the good of salvation when we submit, even when we are fearful, even when we suffer. Because the way that God works is often when saints suffer. Whether it is in the Colosseum facing wild animals or whether it is in the hospital facing a virus. We live to glorify God and we suffer glorifying God. And there's one other thing we have to keep in mind here. He chides his disciples over and over again, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake, be on your guard. Because the hour is at hand when you also are going to enter into temptation. And that was certainly true of Peter. But the disciples are asleep, they've had a big day. And Jesus said to them, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And at this time... Indeed, we may be getting tired, but we need to keep on guard. Because what Satan will try to do during this time is to sow the seeds of doubt into our hearts. That God is not in control. That this is purposeless. But it's not. So as we face our fears, let's remember Jesus, who also faced fears but who's willing to submit to God and tells us when we face our fears, stay awake, stay on guard. This is Holy Week, the week that we remember the sufferings of Jesus Christ, both in body and in soul. And as one commentator said, and this is what I want you to remember, at this very time, when Christ seems to feel that he is the furthest from God, he is in fact the closest to accomplishing the will of God. And that's true for us as well. Let's pray. Jesus, we cannot forget your life and your death. And in these final moments, and hours before you went to Calvary. Help us to see what you went through, the sufferings on our behalf, but may we come away from all of this having the same mindset as you did. May we have the mind of Christ, not only in our comfort, but also in our suffering, and in our fear. And may we also recognize that this is in the hands of God, who is for his people. Amen.